Hi class, welcome back to another fascinating lecture video by the one and only Ms. Tebow. So today um, we're going to go over international trade. I am going to go over this with you guys um, via Zoom on Wednesday as well. I'm excited to see you guys again, uh, but in case you can't be there or in case you like listening to my lectures over and over again, um, here you go. All right, so not a lot of notes today. I did write a lot on your notes as well, more than sometimes I usually do, but I feel like that's only helpful. Um, so why do nations trade? <clears throat> because no country produces everything it needs to survive. Even a country as cool as ours, we actually have a lot more resources than a lot of other countries do because of our size and location. Um, but no one country has everything it needs to, to get by. Every country depends on other countries. So because of international trade, Americans can eat fruit during the winter that's grown in Central America because of international trade. Um, American computers are sold in Africa and they're sold in Asia. In you know, 2005, 10% of all the goods produced in the United States were exported. So we like exporting things, right? We like trade. We like being able to sell our goods to other countries. Um, we do have a larger amount of goods imported or purchased from other countries. Um, but that's still an important thing because it gives us the products we enjoy. You can't not like trading with China and still like shopping um, at any store in the United States, basically, because you will be buying something that was created or manufactured in China. So it's all about obtaining scarce goods because we've so we've talked about scarcity. Remember, um, it, it, we do not have we have an unlimited number of resources on the planet. So trade solves this problem. <clears throat> Nations, nations trade for some goods and services that they could not otherwise have and like maybe as cheaply or maybe that, that were as high quality. So the United States like will buy industrial diamonds, for example, from other countries because um, we have no real mineral deposits here. So that's one of the, the one of the things that we're lacking. Um, so other nations trade for goods that they can't produce with the United States so that we can get the goods that they can produce without them. It's a beautiful thing. Symbiotic relationship. Everyone's gaining something. Um, and part of the advantages of, of why nations trade has to do with creating jobs. It creates new markets. The creating jobs part. So suppose, for example, that American Airlines makers built planes for only American airline companies. If so they would have a limited market, right? There's only so many airplanes we need here because each airline needs only so many new planes each year. We export those planes to companies in other countries, which leads to more planes being made, which means to more Americans having jobs to make those planes, right? It, it expands the market, expands um, who you can sell to. That's a really big uh, deal. <clears throat> so here are some of the advantages. Absolute and comparative advantage. So the main reason countries trade with one another is competitive uh, is comparative advantage. It, uh, this is like the ability of a country to produce a good at a relatively lower cost than another country can. Um, an absolute advantage is when there is an individual or group that can carry out any economic activity way more effectively and efficiently than another group or individual. Comparative advantage just means like we can both countries could probably pull off the same thing, but one of them could do it cheaper. Um, so like the U.S. could manufacture electronics, but why do why are iPhones made in China? Because they can do it cheaper, mostly because they're not paying their workers enough. But we'll talk about that another day. It's also because they have access to different um, resources than we do, natural resources. Uh, but that's a comparative advantage. That's that's why Apple has their their factories in um in China instead of here because it's cheaper. They've, there's a comparative advantage to make it there than it is. It's not an absolute advantage. It's not like we can't make phones out over here, right? It's it's just that in, in comparison, it's a lot cheaper. Um, and we're already paying a thousand bucks for an iPhone. I mean, what in the world would it cost if it was made out over here? Who knows? So comparative advantage leads to nations to specialize. And we've talked about specialization before, but specialization allows countries to like use their scarce resources to be really, really good at one particular thing, right? One economic thing, um, one uh, export that is so much better than everyone else's, they can actually make some money. And it's better because then we'll have better goods, right? If you're an ex, if you, that country is an expert at making certain goods, they're gonna be really good at making those goods and then we'll have quality goods. And we like that, we like specialization. When a country produces more than they can actually use, they sell their extra amount abroad, right? 
just like the airplane example I just gave. Um, if we were only selling in America, there's only a certain number of airplanes we even want for the, the companies here, and then they'd be done. But when they can make more and then sell them to other countries, it's much better. Um, countries can have comparative advantages in particular resources, resources like oil deposits, right? Uh, in the U.S., we have skilled workers in advanced technology. We that's our thing. We have educated, smart people here, and um, which may, which is the skilled workers part. And we are a relatively advanced uh, country. That should not be shocking to anyone. Um, things like oil deposits, right? Like if you, we have some in our country because of like Alaska and stuff and in the ocean. But if you're a country that just happens not to have oil deposits, you don't have. A, if you want any oil, you have to trade. Because you can't just suddenly make yourself have oil by killing dinosaurs millions of years ago. Not how that works. Um, so that is something that like a comparative advantage from a natural resource is. From a natural resource. So barriers to international trade. Um, so many consumers like us like to buy cheaper goods, right? We like to buy things that are made in other countries, a lot of times when it says made in, made in China, made in Indonesia, made in Vietnam, right? We are buying those things because it's cheaper to do so. It's cheaper to make them there so they can sell them for cheaper. So when a country does this, when companies do this, um, our country kind of loses, right? Because we are deciding to buy the cheaper option from a different country instead of an option, like think of like a t-shirt. So we can make t-shirts here and they can make t-shirts in other countries. They can do it cheaper in other countries. So why does that matter? Well, because the people who make those t-shirts over here are losing business because people aren't going to buy their t-shirts because it's um, more expensive and we do generally like cheaper things as a consumer because it's logical. We don't want to spend as much money. Luckily today we're starting the whole, you know, it's, it's now become a, it's made in America, so it's worth it to spend more money. And there are people who buy into that, but some people don't have that option, right? You need the cheapest thing you can get because that's what you can afford. Um, and the problem with that is that it could make people go out of business, right? If, if, if enough people don't buy the product because it's more expensive, that company, that store um, could go out of business and lose their jobs based on the competition with other countries. So when this happens, a lot of times the government will step in and impose trade barriers to protect people who work here. So this has actually happened in like car companies um, because we have car companies here, right? Ford and that's why is that the only one I can think of? Chevy, right? We have our, our car, car companies here. <clears throat> but there's car companies in Japan and Korea and they make good cars too and Europe, right? Um, and what started happening was people here were buying Toyotas instead of Fords in the United States. And so the car companies in the United States were suffering. And so the government stepped in and put trade barriers in place to make it, um, to give an incentive for Americans to buy American made cars instead of foreign cars, right? Made it a little bit more expensive to get the foreign cars and a little bit cheaper to get the American made cars in order to just, you know, we, we employ, it's not healthy for an economy if you got a lot of people who are suddenly unemployed. Um, we wanna make sure that our own products are something that we want to buy. So sometimes the government will step in just to make sure that um, we do still have uh, produ a productive market in something. The car, the car industry is probably the best example. So there are other barriers to international trade as well. Um, the two most common kinds of barriers are tariffs and quotas, which are a little bit different. So a tariff is a tax on an imported good. Um, so if the United States wants to protect American steel workers, for example, it can put a 20% tariff or tax. You can just replace the word tariff with tax if that makes your life easier. Um, they can put a 20% tax on all imported steel thus adding 20% to its price. So all of a sudden, the steel from other countries might not be cheaper because there's a, um, the country is having to pay a tax to import the goods in. And the country's not just gonna pay the tax, they're gonna make the, the product more expensive. That's why saying that like tariffs on China is making China pay is just not true because what happens is China's just gonna up the price on all the goods they sell and then we're actually paying for the up updated price, right? It's not just because there's a tax doesn't mean that the country itself is taxed, but it's an incentive for us, the consumer, 
to not buy something from another country if it's going to be more expensive. Um, that's why they add taxes to it. Uh, the goal is to make the price of the imported good higher or maybe the same price as the domestic good and actually give the domestic, the local good, the one made in the United States, a chance of actually um, being bought by the consumers. <clears throat> right. See, as a result, consumers will be more likely to buy the domestic product. Um, however, when people want the foreign products so badly that the higher prices have little effect on demand, countries have to set quota. So quota is like the next step. Um, in this case, countries can block trade with quotas or they can limit the amount of foreign goods. So let's use the car companies again. So during the 1980s, when Japanese cars, which is like a Toyota, were so popular, American auto worker jobs were threatened. And that was a lot of jobs. There are a lot of people who work in the American auto industry, like hundreds and hundreds, like not a small number of people would be unemployed. Reagan, who was president at the time, put a quota on Japanese automobiles. So he basically said, there's only this number of these cars that are allowed to come into the country, right? And that's how many we'll pay for. And that's it. Once they're gone, they're gone. And that by making it so that it's not an unlimited number of Toyotas coming in, um, it made it so that the, uh, the automobile workers were in the America were selling more cars because there weren't as many Japanese automobiles in place. Kind of makes sense. Um, tariffs are very common. Tariffs are normal. They, tariffs happen all the time. Um, we don't like tariffs in general because it makes things more expensive, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily always horrible. Quotas are a more extreme version. It's where you actually set a number limitation on what how many of the goods are actually coming in. Trade agreements. So in general, trade barriers cost more than they benefit. So like I know a lot of people think that like, you know, let's let's stop trading with other countries. Let's only concentrate on America, right? It's all about America first. That's a big thing that's happening right now, nationalism. Um, so like why would we be paying money to other countries to get their goods when we should just use American made stuff? So like, let's put trade barriers in place to make it harder for people to trade with us. That's not a really good thing. Most poly policy makers, like most people agree that the total cost of a trade barrier is a lot higher than the benefit, right? So if you're weighing that cost benefit analysis, which is a lot of what econ is, it costs a lot more to have a trade barrier in place than to just have free trade. So overall, countries aim to have free trade. Um, to increase trade, countries can join together with a few key trading partnerships to make it easier, which is what we do. Um, for example, the European Union. So the European Union, we are not a part of it because I don't know if you knew this about the United States, but we're not in Europe. But it's still a really cool idea. It's kind of like if you think about Europe, right? The United States is huge. Getting from one end to the other is like thousands of miles. Um, Europe is the same, but every country in Europe is kind of small, right? Some of them are bigger than others, but overall, like the fact that you can, you know, skip through a couple of countries in a day is kind of crazy to me when well, we live in the United States because it's just so big. So the European Union, because it's so many different countries, they kind of were like, all right, if we're going to trade with one another, we need to make this as easy as possible. Um, we're constantly going in and out of each other's borders. We're right next to each other. We don't have much space anyways. Um, why would we bother making trade difficult? So what they pretty much did was they they formed like a union and made it so that the, the European Union is its own marketplace. Instead of each individual country kind of representing themselves and having their own rules and regulations, the European Union, union does it together. And it makes it a lot easier to trade. It makes it a lot easier to travel. Um, and I think it was honestly necessary for the European Union to do this. Think of if like the United States, if every single state had different trade rules or if every single if, if to trade with a state, you had to, you know, draw up the contracts and there would be tariffs on things. And just to just to like if you were making something in North Carolina and you want to sell in South Carolina, what if you had huge barriers to go through? Right. We don't have that, which because we're one country, of course, but European Union, that's what would have happened if they didn't have the, the EU, if all of those European countries were just separate. It would be kind of chaotic and they wouldn't be making much money. And people like making some money. So um, in 2002, they actually made like a universal dollar, which was the euro in for the European Union. That way, uh, you know, every European country didn't just have their own currency. And then, you know, we'll talk about currency in a minute and why that matters. But it, it was just a way to, to bring them all together. 
Um, and so like if you go, uh, well, see, Great Britain is no longer in the EU, but uh, well, last time I was in London, they were in the EU and you could use a euro to pay for things or you could use a pound. A pound was the British dollar, is the British dollar. Um, and it's just cool that all of the countries now accept uh, the same currency in the euro if you're in the European Union. This, uh, so Brexit, which you might have heard of before, it was voted on in 2016. And basically the people of Great Britain decided they want to leave the European Union. Um, and it's still, they're trying to figure out how exactly to do that. It was, it's kind of like you had, they had no trade barriers, you know, in place to trade with other countries in Europe. And then all of a sudden they had a ton of trade barriers that they had to deal with. And it's a lot to sort through. So they're still trying to work that out. Um, but that's kind of the uh, reason it's so much handier to have like this trade agreement. So then look at our side, right? I mean, it's not Europe, right? We don't have a lot of tiny countries all squished together, but we do have our Northern and Southern friends. We've got Mexico and Canada. So in the nineties, we made the North American free trade agreement, also known as NAFTA. Um, so this pact, um, it eventually eliminated the barriers to trade among these countries, which is cool, which is why our biggest trading partner and our BFF is Canada, because they're right there. Um, so they're not only handy in terms of location, but uh, we have a good trade um, like rapport with them. Um, we have really good trade policies in place to make it easier to trade with them. Since NAFTA was enacted, trade among those three countries, Mexico, United States, and Canada, has grown twice as fast as separate economies, right? That's that's why it's nice to have this free trade because we really do make more money. It's like proven that if free trade around the world, people are just making money. But opponents of NAFTA contended that American workers would lose jobs because U.S. plants would move to Mexico because it is cheaper to make stuff in Mexico um, because you can get you can pay people less money to do work, basically. Um, so NAFTA supporters argue, though, that the increase in trade would stimulate growth and help all of those people out. So there's pros and cons to NAFTA. The only reason I'm even bringing it up, because technically NAFTA doesn't exist anymore, is because, first of all, as far as I know, they still ask you questions about it on state tests. Not that you still have a state test in this class, but um, there was definitely a question about NAFTA on the last state test I gave for civics. Um, but other than that, it's 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 still actually implemented because here I'll, I'll skip ahead. Here are a couple of videos that talk to you about NAFTA and about this new policy. So very, very recently, like very recently, we got rid of NAFTA and we updated it, quote, to um, the USMCA, which is the United States, Mexico, Canada agreement. So it's an updated version of NAFTA. Um, it includes major changes on cars, new policies. I'm not gonna go into details about what it changes. All you really need to know is that on July 1st of this year, this is how recent this is, we don't have NAFTA anymore. We have this new trade agreement. And it doesn't really matter what the trade agreement says, you just have to know that it's a new trade agreement. Um, if you go into econ or politics, you might wanna look more into it. But for the purposes of our class, you don't necessarily need to know it. Um, and although NAFTA is officially dead, technically, with COVID, with the economic crisis we're going through right now, it's gonna take years and years for like the new updated agreement to really come into effect and to really be implemented. Cause it's not easy to take a huge trade agreement between three massive economies and just change it. Um, it takes a while. And right now with things being off cray, um, it may take longer than they anticipated. But technically we do not have NAFTA, technically we have USMCA now, uh -huh. which is kind of cool. The United States, Mexico, Canada agreement. Um, financing trade. So the United States uses the dollar as its medium of exchange. That shouldn't be surprising to you. You've seen one, heard of it, held one, maybe even five, maybe $10 at one point. Who knows? You might be super fancy. So that's our currency. If you were going to go to Mexico, Mexico, they have a peso right? In Japan, they have the yen. In England, they have the pound. In Europe, of all of Europe, they have the euro. Um, it's just the thing that you use to buy things. It's your currency for your country. Um, if you travel outside of the United States, or if you invest in and for a business, but let's pretend like you're probably more likely to travel outside of the United States right now than you would be to invest, although no one's going anywhere right now. 
But hypothetically, in a nice world where we're actually able to go places, let's pretend like you're going somewhere. You need to know the exchange rate. What is the price of your nation's currency in terms of another nation's currency? So most of the world's nation uses a flexible exchange rate system. Um, and under the system, the forces of supply and demand are allowed to set prices on various currencies. So a currency's price may change from day to day. So like one dollar may equal 100 pesos, may equal 10 yen, may equal three and a half euros. Um, and the only reason it matters is because when you go to that country, you'll, you know, turn it into one currency and get the exchange rate back if you go to the correct places. Not everywhere will do that. Um, and that matters. It is part of the balancing the trade, right? Um, so if we talk about balancing of trade, balance of trade is pretty much the difference between the nation's exports and imports. But like, think about it. How would we accurately know how much we're being charged by China, right? If we're not given it in dollar amounts, if we're given it in um, a different currency, we don't know what that even means. We need to have an exchange rate. What? Okay, so when you say this costs, you know, if Japan says this costs 10 yen, what does that mean for dollar? How many dollars does that mean? Like that means nothing to me. Um, if something costs a thousand pesos, how many dollars is that? What does that mean? Um, usually the US dollar is pretty, pretty strong, which is good. It means that if you take your US dollar um, and you exchange it in another country, you're more likely to be able to buy more things than less things. It's nice. When I go visit my family in Costa Rica, I can bring, you know, I, last time I went, I was like 16. So like I um, brought, you know, 100 of my own bucks down, exchanged it out. And I was able to buy way more with that $100 changed into Costa Rican currency than I would have been here because things are just cheaper there. Um, so my dollar went further, which was really cool. This isn't exactly easy to understand. Um, all you really need to understand about it is that it's important for trade because we need to understand how much things cost in other currencies, right? Or how much we're spending of other currencies and why that's relevant. Um, it's all very important for trade. So last slide, positive and negative balance of trade. So the balance of trade, like we just talked about, is the difference between the value of our exports and imports. So like in the United States, for example, we do um, import more than we export, which means we bring more goods in from other countries than we export to other countries. If a nation's currency depreciates or becomes weak, the nation will likely export more goods because its products will become cheaper. If a nation's currency appreciates in value, it will become strong and exports will decline. That's why our exports aren't necessarily high because th we, things cost a lot of money here. And then when we put them overseas for their own currency in Japan and in Mexico and in whatever, it costs even more. And so we don't export very much, but that's actually kind of good because that means our currency is really high and, and we're just a, we're bougie and we're expensive, right? If you get the American product, you're, you're, you're spending the money. Um, and that's kind of cool because it just means that we have our, our currency is high. It, it means that we have lower exports, which isn't good necessarily, but it means that our currency is high. Um, the reason that Mexico and China have so many exports is because they're ch making cheap stuff, right? It's easy. We can buy it for cheap. That's not as exciting. We want the bougie stuff. We want the top shelf, whatever. That's America. We are that top shelf, nice product. Um, but anyways, let's talk about surplus and deficit because this actually matters. So when the value of a nation exports exceeds its imports, it's a positive balance of trade. So that means that you're um, giving, you're, you're putting, selling more things abroad than you are bringing things in from abroad. So for example, if the value of a country's exports is $100 billion and the value of the imports is $50 billion, then the country has a positive balance of $50 billion. Um, that's a trade surplus. A negative balance is a trade deficit, right? It's the opposite. It's where you, are, you have more exports than you do imports. Um, and it makes it sound kind of negative and and you know, negative and positive makes it sound like one's a bad and one's a good thing. But it, I don't want you to think that just because the United States has more exports, or I'm sorry, just because the United States has more imports and exports doesn't mean we're doing something wrong. Um, we do want to maybe try and balance that out, right? We want to try and get less things imported. And we do want to try and export more, more items. It, it would be good for our economy, but it's not horrible. We're not, you know, in a horrible situation because of it. So you guys have some assignments this week that will help you understand a couple of these. 
ideas more. And we're going to go over them on Zoom on Wednesday. So if you do have any questions, you can ask me then, or you can always shoot me an email. All right. Thank you guys.